Is this thing on? Right, where are my glasses? Right, let's get started. <laughs> Good morning folks and welcome to the workshop and welcome to an updated version of the saddle stitch in detail. Why am I updating this video? Well this video, that video, not this video, that video, is now 10 years old and in the last 10 years an awful lot has changed, particularly in relation to the tools. So and me. I mean, if we have a quick look back at the old version, we can see 10 years hasn't necessarily been kind. Certainly the colours dropped away from a few things. So what, what are we going to achieve? You want to learn how to saddle stitch. I'm going to give you advice on how to do that. I'm going to teach you how to do it. I'm going to teach you why we do it. I'm going to teach you where you can apply it. The internet is full of information on this very topic. Unfortunately, an awful lot of that information is misinformation. It's not necessarily wrong, but an awful lot of it is out of context. And it doesn't fit every situation where you need to stitch. In the past 10 years, since the onset of these new irons, things have changed and I've developed a style of stitching and I call it my pre-pricking style of stitching and it is particular to leather work. It's very important to realize that leather work is not saddlery. They're different. They both work with leather but they're different disciplines. A saddler or a bridle maker or a harness maker or heavy horse has to produce what's called a working seam. Better known probably in this day and age as a traditional style of saddle stitching. And I am going to cover traditional style of saddle stitching, but we are going to start with the modern style of saddle stitching. Mainly because one, it's quicker to achieve. Two, if you want to then go into traditional style of stitching, it's a really nice stepping stone. And I'll explain why in more detail as we get to it. The main difference between the traditional style of saddle stitch and the modern style of saddle stitch is the absence of the awl. With the modern style of stitching you don't need the awl and be under no illusion out of all the tools that you find here in the workshop this is one of the hardest ones to learn how to use well. The reason people use an awl to produce a working seam is to prevent what's called slippage or riding that's where the thread moves independently of the leather. If you're using a natural fibre, the, fur will, uh, the thread will fur and snap, the seam will fail. If you're using a synthetic fibre, the thread will saw at the leather, the seam will fail. So it has to be produced so every stitch is locked into place. It's got nothing to do with this knot that you hear about. It's about making the hole the correct size to suit the thread that you are stitching so each stitch is locked into place. Beeswax is not enough. I say, well, I hear a lot of people say, well, I use linen, I beeswax it, that locks it in. Beeswax will dissipate as you condition the leather, as the leather gets wet, as the leather gets warm. That's not enough to lock it in. You have to use a tool like this to ensure that those stitches are locked into place. But this is not the saddlery part or the traditional or working seam part of the video, we are looking as leather workers at the more modern style. And we have a huge luxury that saddlers don't have. We can produce a different hole. This in turn changes how we produce our stitching. This means stitching leather goods like belts, wallets and bags all of a sudden has become much, much easier. It still has its own problems. Context is very, very important. And we're gonna look at what we should be doing, why we should be doing it, what we are doing, and perhaps why we shouldn't. So we're gonna have a look at some of the tools we're going to use, 
and the techniques and there'll be more waffle i'll make no apologies about the waffle in this video i'll make no apologies about the length of the video some of you may be sitting there thinking an hour an hour and a half i don't know what it's going to be but it's going to be lengthy i will try and be succinct i can't make any promises you look at the videos that are on youtube they're 20 minutes long this is how to saddle stitch in 20 minutes you are not going to learn everything you need to know from a 20 minute video think of it this way this is not a how-to video this is a lesson imagine coming to me and spending time with me to learn this skill set this is the closest thing you're going to get without physically coming we're going to take a day to do this and we're not going to do it in 20 minute chunks so this is a lesson it's a comprehensive lesson it's really really detailed we go down a rabbit hole here it's worth persevering with even if you don't watch it in one hit watch it in order don't skip it there's a lot of good stuff in here and even with the waffle the waffle is important so yeah it's a big video this this is it, just imagine what the director's cut's going to be like i'm about to give you some advice is it good advice i can be very convincing i can show you things and you go oh right, that's fantastic that's great i'll do that and anybody can give advice listen to all advice but you don't have to take it all and the internet is is fantastic and terrible all at once it's fantastic because you can find anything but the difficulty is you put a question into the, the internet you almost have to know the answer to know what you're looking for because you will find 10 20 100 different versions of the same answer and you go oh, i don't know which one I don't, I don't know if this works if somebody's telling you this is what you should do do not be frightened about asking them to qualify that obviously do it nicely but if somebody says, oh no, the first, you know, what do I need? I've just started leather work. What do I need? Oh, you need an awl. Okay, so I'll go out and buy an awl. No, no, you need an awl. Why? Why do I need an awl? And ask them to qualify their answer. Oh, you should be doing this. Can you give me a demonstration of how you apply that? Can you show me what you mean? If they can, and there's validity and it's backed up by either a demonstration or an image or whatever it be then the likelihood is that's going to be good advice but if they can't you have to question that advice and and that's that's where i'm focusing that i suppose a little bit of a dig there are so many people that are keyboard warriors sitting at home that have had one lesson that all of a sudden they're an expert and they say oh i'll jump on board and i'll do that you also have to question the amount of time people are spending online if they're answering questions every five minutes they're not doing any work so let's have a look at what they've done if you and, and, and th this is important one i'm going to show you so i'm going to qualify what i'm saying but two if you want an understanding of the results of what i teach go to my website armitageleather.com go to the gallery and look at all the students images of work that my students have undertaken as a result of instruction from me if you like what you see and i'm not saying about the design or the practicality of its use i'm on about the the presentation the construction if you like what you see and go well yes that's what i want to do then you know that the advice you're about to get here is advice that suits you because you might not want that therefore your advice needs to be different and you find a different source there's plenty of them what I am covering is the development of the modern style of saddle stitching. Ten years ago, I created the saddle stitch in detail. Eight years ago, the increase in the new irons began to really take a foothold. In those last ten to eight years, I have developed this pre-pricking style of saddle stitching that is effective. It's versatile. You can use it in different situations. I'm going to show you this. And what's 
the absolute most important part of this is at any point if you become interrupted if you have to turn something round if you are restricted and have to stitch in a different direction you can find the correct stitch by looking at the information that's already in front of you and I will show you how to find that let's make a start so let's have a look then at some tools that we can use to make our holes in leather there is a distinct difference between pricking irons and stitching irons and this is to do with the angle of the tooth you tend to find on some of the more traditional style of pricking irons that the angle is quite severe and the tooth comes to a point that's absolutely fine because they are not designed to fully penetrate the leather here we have a modern selection but these two here would be called pricking irons because in particular with the Amy Rourke one we can see that the tooth actually angles quite a lot so as a pricking iron this would work a dream and it's a really really nice iron not only that it's beautiful but we would be reticent about driving this iron through a thick piece of leather if you were working thin leather 1.52 mil then you can make your holes all the way through with this however if you're going three mil up then this isn't necessarily the sort of thing that will do the job for you we come to wootar now wootar still seems to have this taper going on on each tooth at each side but the tooth in the middle or the teeth in the middle are a lot slimmer which means it will go in a lot further and if you imagine each tooth acting exactly the same way as an all blade does it's going right through the leather now again with the working seam we have to govern the size of the hole so we go in as deep as we need to and we can see it goes to a tip so we can have a very small hole for a fine stitch much bigger hole for a much bigger stitch here you are given what you are given if you drive and this is the KS blade which is we can see one of the most slenderest teeth very similar in fact in style to the Crimson Hide both of these are excellent for the modern style of stitching the pre-pricking method that I'm about to show you because the teeth do broaden out they get thicker as they get towards the top of the body but they don't broaden out so much that they will damage the leather if you fully penetrate the leather then we go to a little bit more of a brutal style and these started out being called stitching chisels well a chisel is something you work a piece of wood with they're not chisels at all uh, they're irons still a stitching iron we can see here the teeth are much larger the hole that they make is more of a rectangular offset not quite a diamond but not far off you can still achieve a really good stitch with these and this 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 was this tool was sent to me by, um, by Simon from Goods Japan uh, and Simon if you're watching it still got them this is what turned the whole process of how to stitch around and this what is what I used to begin my pre-pricking technique and I will introduce this in the video I, I will show you this because there is merit to this we can see it's been polished sometimes they come a little bit rough that makes it hard work to get the iron out of the leather there are lots of companies still producing irons like this and you can still produce a credible stitch with it so it, there's merit and there's a place for it but certainly of the the modern style if you are looking at a thinner leather these give a beautiful crisp hole uh, these wutar ones are absolutely gorgeous but they are pricking iron so you're limited to how thick a leather you can work to whereas the ks blade and the crimson hide and this this is not the full list the list goes on there are so many others um and if there are irons out there that people want me to review send them to me i will review them and let you know my thoughts and feelings somebody brought up an interesting question on the iron review you haven't given a bad review on any irons that's because i haven't failed to achieve 
a good quality stitch with any of these irons. They all have their different place. They all have a different place in the ranking. I am not going to tell you, and I'm not going to answer emails or answer the question in emails, which one would I choose? Which one is the best? That's very much down to you. It's a personal preference. What style of stitching are you doing? What are you making? What leather are you using? How thick is it? All of these are decisions for you to make. Watch the review videos on YouTube. Um, there's lots of information in there and what's more is you can see the results of each one of these irons as I produce a stitch. As soon as you see one you like the look of, that's the one that's good for you. It might be that you stick with that, you might go exclusive KS or Wutar. What I will say is the one thing about KS Blade is they offer the greatest range. Greatest range in SPI, greatest range in reverse irons. They go from something like 5 to 12 all in reverse and any number of tooth that you want it's a versatile range there's a good range with the crimson hide probably the next best and next broadest range i'm kind of getting into the point of reviewing here but what i'm going to do is i'm going to have um, these tools because i think these are probably some of the most common ones and we're going to look at making our holes and what we get from them so let's get a piece of leather I'm using a piece of three millimeter shoulder for this exercise. If you are on the cusp of starting out, it's very tempting to think I will buy a bag of scraps and I will use those as practice pieces. With any bag of scraps that you buy, you buy a five kilo bag of scraps or a 10 pound bag of scraps, depending on where you are. 70% of what's in there is rubbish. It's just a way of people getting rid of their tap from the workshop. And I get a lot of people come to the workshop saying, I'm doing this, I'm doing it the right way, I'm doing it your way, it's just not working. We look at the materials that they're using and they're using side and they're using chrome or they're using a particularly poorly tanned leather that's very spongy or inconsistent because we can stitch two inches of our leather, it looks fine, we stitch the next inch and it looks horrible because everything's just sunk in. Because we've got a very um, inconsistent tanning process or the back is horrendously rough. People are constantly asking the question, how, how do I make the back of fluffy leather look good? It's a simple answer, it's so simple. Don't buy leather that's fluffy on the back. There's a really good reason it's fluffy. It's hiding stuff. It's not a quality finish. You look at the back of this and it's finished. Even if you're buying russet with unfinished, uh, an unfinished leather, it should have a smooth, consistent back if it's been cut well. If it's fluffy, it ain't gonna do you any favors. And when you start stitching it, the feedback you get from that leather is not representative of your skill set. If you don't know that, you will try and fix problems that you're not causing. They are caused by the leather. So, if you are on the cusp, buy the best leather you can afford. Something that is from a reputable company. Here in the UK, you've got Cracks, Abbey, and Metropolitan, this is lived in from Metropolitan. It's three mil thick, it's finished on the front beautifully, it's finished on the back beautifully. It's probably the leather that I use to teach the most because first and foremost, I trust it. I trust it to give the correct feedback when a student is learning. If it doesn't look right, we know it's not the leather, it's something they're doing, so therefore it's easier to fix. And that's the big problem with leather work. It is problem solving. How do I do this? How do I solve that problem? So th the problem is, if something's going wrong and you don't know what it is, you can't fix it. And, and, and problem solving is about, okay, so how do I put this together? I put it together like this. It works. Brilliant. We move forward. It doesn't work. And it's understanding why not? Why didn't it work? And if we're let down by our materials, by our tools, by our techniques, we have to be able to highlight that so we can fix it and we can move forward. 
So spending that bit more money on a better quality leather will give you better feedback, which means you will develop quicker. So you can, you can spend 150 quid on three hides of leather and you work your way through them. 50 pound a hide sounds really cheap, I'll practice, and you're not developing, okay? And where you're at, by time you finished the third hide, is not necessarily where you want to be. But if you spend 150 quid on one hide, the feedback is almost guaranteed. You will develop quicker, and the likelihood is by the time you're at the end of that hide, you are where you want to be. Buy the right tool, learn the right technique, buy the right materials. It makes a huge difference. Anyway, waffle. Let's get down to the board and have a look at what we do with these tools. So let's do some damage to a bit of leather. Let's start off perhaps with these, because I think it's what most people will have in their arsenal when they start out. Whether they buy the decent ones from Kyoshinelli or Craftshire or the cheap ones off Amazon, these are affordable. I don't know whether it's for me, I'll buy the cheapest tool, I'll buy one of these Amazon sets and something like this comes along. And it's what we start with. But again, I've just put these on a polishing mark, polish them up and they do work. Even a cheap tool will work. But does this look familiar? When we go to make a set of holes, we end up with that. We've gone completely off track. There is no one part of stitching an item that is any less critical than any other part. And uh, uh, this is why I make no apologies about being verbose and waffly, same thing, different word. There are people that are learning from me and regurgitating it back saying, I've got a quicker video and they're missing critical parts out. That is taking the context away. And whilst this is a lengthy video, you are learning everything. So stick with it. Don't skip. Don't make an assumption, well, I'll try a little bit of that and try a little bit of that. Don't blend this style of stitching with another technique that you saw. It's about consistency. And that's what lets us down. This is a prime example. We have gone to make a set of holes. We haven't really worked out where we're gonna make the holes and we immediately have lost consistency. If we try and stitch that to another piece, our only alternative is to glue this to the piece and go through it as one piece. We can't pre-prick it. And then we've got an awful lot of work to make, try and make it look straight. This line could be encroaching into the internal aspect. It could be a pocket for a card or uh, any number of things. And then the item doesn't fit. Every part of this technique is as critical as every other part. There is no shortcut. Well, there is a shortcut, the shortcut to the kettle or the loo, but that's it. Everything needs to be done properly. What we do here affects what we do there, affects what we do there. So we start off. The first thing, we have a clean cut. If we have a clean cut, we can add a clean line. Now I like these dividers. These are Osborne's. I've been using these for years and you've seen them in almost every video. However, in recent years, I've been, or well, not in recent years, last year I was sent these uh, by Crimson Hyde and these are stitch markers. These are absolutely beautiful. These are fantastic. We can set our dividers to four millimeters, and we're gonna talk about four millimeters in a moment. We can set our dividers to four millimeters. We do a line on a piece of leather. We then have to change the dividers because there's another technique we want to do and we need the dividers to do a line for it. We come back and we reset our dividers, but now we set our dividers to 3.8 millimeters or 4.2 millimeters, and we vary. And if we're trying to stitch two pieces of leather together, 
and we fail on being consistent with this tool, the stitching all of a sudden is misaligned, which means when we get two pieces of leather together, they're not flat. And if they're not flat, then we've got work to do. We may have to take half a millimeter or a millimeter off one edge. And that one is increasing the production time, but two is highlighting inconsistency. So either you have something like this and you have to set it incredibly consistently every single time, or you go for something like this, and this will give you your consistency. So here I have a four millimeter one. Why four millimeters? Let me run a line down. So a very fine line, beautifully done, make it a little heavier so it comes out on camera a little clearer. Why four millimeters? It's a starting point. It's a very good starting point. It's a good starting point because if you stitch everything at four millimeters and you get it right, it will look good. But if you stitch it at four millimeters and you make a mistake, you've got this 3.8 on the back and you have 4.2 millimeters on the front, your leather is misaligned. So you've got to take it down. So that's a little extreme, but let's say for instance, that's the problem that you've got. You end up with a four mil stitch line on the front because you take the back leather down to the front, but you turn it over and all of a sudden now you've got a three mil stitch line on the back. That's gonna be difficult to spot because you can't put the front next to the back. If it happens on the same piece on the front of the top and the side, and you've got three mil here and four mil here, that becomes obvious. But if your variation is front to back, it's easier to hide. But if you do have to trim it down and you end up with a three mil stitch line, it still looks good. But you have a whole millimeter of safety. If your cutting, if your stitch marking is not up to what you want it to be at that time, give yourself a healthy margin. And that healthy margin is by setting your stitch line at four millimeters. As you get good, you can come down. These tools go from five all the way down to two. All of them are good tools and all of them are about valid. Yes, there are items where you can have a two millimeter stitch line, but you have absolutely no tolerance at two millimeter. You're backing yourself into a corner where it has to be good. So you use these tools when you are good. If you're cutting your teeth, four mil. Even if you are an adept leather worker that's been going at it for some time, four millimeter still looks fantastic. It works on a wallet, it works on a belt, it works on a sheath. As we get into bridal leather, five millimeters is better suited, but there's a different reason for that. So that's why we choose four millimeters. Let's go on to the irons. I'm going to start off with the Crimson Hide. They are gorgeous irons. Now, when I teach here in the workshop, and what I'm going to be using in this video is seven SPI, 3.85 millimeters. Why? The reason that I choose seven SPI, 3.85 millimeters, is because it is one of the most forgiving SPI stitches per inch. The reason it's the most forgiving is when our holes are made, our holes are far enough apart that our holes automatically begin to govern the thread. If your stitching is not on point, seven SPI holes will help pull the thread at the right angle for you. If you start stitching at eight or nine SPI, what's happening is the holes are getting closer together. And this relationship between the bottom of this hole and the top of this hole here and as they get closer together it changes the angle of the stitch as the angle of the stitch changes you have to be on point to make sure that you are doing everything basically prioritizing your thread correctly to ensure that you get a face stitch that's correct if your stitching isn't on point that will let you down so you can go too tight an SPI and work against yourself. 
and I can't get my stitching right. I don't know why. It's just not working. It's the wrong tool. Especially if you are choosing the wrong lever. These combinations can come together and it's all now about problem solving. I think I'm doing it right. What else could it be? It could be the leather. Change the leather. It could be the tool. Change the tool. If you then achieve, at which point then you can move forward. So my recommendation to you, if you are cutting your teeth or if you're having problems, is 7SPI with a 4mm stitch line. It's the path of least resistance. You will achieve far better, far quicker, because the results are sympathetic to you learning. Don't try and choose a technique that is not sympathetic to you developing and learning. Learn the technique, understand the nuances of the stitch. Tension is a huge issue. As your SPI changes, you've got a smaller piece of leather between the holes. So therefore your tension becomes critical. If you are not au fait with your tension, you want as big a piece of leather between those two holes as possible, because even if you over tension, or if you're a little bit slack with it, you will still achieve. Now the question is what iron to start with when we're making our holes? Well, let's, let's come back to this one. Well, let's talk about the difference between the two for a moment. The distinct difference between these two is the tip of these teeth are flat. The tip of these teeth are pointed. Now both KS Blade and Crimson Hide also do diamond teeth irons which are both pointed, very similar to this. What's the advantage of a diamond tooth over a standard tooth? And it's not a flat, it's not a French tooth. Okay, the misnomer about that is the last website that was selling irons when these new irons came on was Blanchard. So all the information that the Japanese, the Chinese, the South Koreans took, took from Blanchard. So that's why you've got round dent. That's English and French in the same sentence. It doesn't work, it's a round tooth. So it's not dent, so all you makers out there, um, it's not dent, it's tooth and they're not French, I will accept European, but certainly the English have made 11 different uh, sets of irons where the French have only made two. So, and there's an argument over who started it. And you go into Hermes, half the tools that you find in there are Dixons. So I'll leave you to work that one out. Anyway, pointy teeth. What does a pointed tooth give you? It gives you the ability to find the line. If you can't keep your iron straight, then you can actually put this tooth into the line and it self levels. So that locates the tooth, giving us a much more consistent and straight line for our holes. The temptation is just to give this a massive wallop. That's fine. If you can keep your iron beautifully straight, then yes, go straight to a wallop. But if you are cutting your teeth, and I appreciate this video is on saddle stitching, but it's this or these techniques that are the foundation of that stitch. It's no good learning how to stitch when and where to cast if our holes aren't any good. Like I said, it's gonna be a lengthy video. So we're gonna pop our iron onto our leather, locating the tip of that tooth in the line. And we're not going to give it a wallop, we're just going to give it a kiss. Because all we're doing is marking our holes, we are not making them. And we are looking at consistently marking our holes down our line. Now I'm going to overlap two teeth, back on the line, and I'm going to work my way down. Overlapping two, hang on to that iron, give it a thumb, overlap two, onto that line, give it a thump. Not a thump, no, a kiss. Now that's given us a nice, consistently straight set of holes. We haven't made our holes. But if we go at something a little too brutally, we might run off. But in taking our time, marking first, 
consistency will begin to appear. Now we're happy with the placement of our holes because our placement of our holes become the holes. The holes become the stitches. It cascades forward. What we do here affects what we do there. The better this is, the better that will be. So what we're going to do now is actually make our holes. Now I have a pad here and it has a four millimeter PVC sheet glued to it. This is soft, it accommodates the iron, which means I can punch through. And I'm gonna punch all the way through and I only need to punch through to the shoulder of the tooth because as soon as we're past that shoulder, the length of the, or the width of the tooth beyond that is the same. It doesn't matter how deep I go, it will give me the same size hole. So I'm gonna pop it on there and I'll do this first one on the end. And we'll give it a good thumb or two. We'll take it out the pad and we'll have a look at the back. How much steel is poking through? And I've gone through there about three millimeters. That's absolutely fine. But we're beyond that shoulder. That hole will get no bigger if I drive the tool in further. We've still got plenty of teeth left. But how do we take it out? How many times do we see this? where he's just zip it out. No, and the reason no. One, we can see that's distorted the surface of the leather. It's actually distorted the shape of the holes. And most importantly, we're putting this last tooth under such stress it can snap. And that's the greatest cause of snapped teeth there is. So what we're going to do is we're going to be a little bit more gentle to our tool and our leather. It's about tool sympathy, it's about material sympathy. If we are sympathetic to the both, this will last longer, this will look better. Our holes are marked. We can pop our teeth back in those holes. Hold our tool, give it a good thump, pop it out the pad and have a look how much steel have we got poking out the back. And there I've got about a three mil. I'm gonna stick with three mil, it's a good number. What we're not going to do is zip that tool out because we zip the tool out, we're damaging the leather, we're damaging the tool. So we're gonna get a chock of wood, any old chock of wood. I'm using the Armitage leather iron pulling block thing. We put that flat up against the tool and we try and do it on camera, but, and there we go. Then the tool just comes out the leather. And we can see there that we haven't distorted the hole, we haven't distorted the leather. There will always be a level of distortion. The reason for the distortion is certainly with this tool, the teeth have been polished. So it's only the tip that's sharp. The body is not sharp. The hole has not been cut that size, it has been stretched. The tip of the tooth is going through the leather, the body of the tooth is stretching the hole. So the longer we leave that leather, the more those holes will naturally close up on their own. So we continue. I don't need to overlap holes because I've made a whole row. So whereas I've finished here, I can now start here. I don't need to overlap two teeth. Pop it back on, pop it out of the way, have a look, and we can see we've got three millimetres of steel. Exactly the same again, I'll do this from the other side. Pop the pulling block up against the tool, press, that pops, that comes out. No stress to the leather, no stress to the tool. Let's do that a couple more times. By the very nature of what we've just done, we have distorted the leather around the holes. But before we start stitching, what we can do is just get a cloth, wrap it around our finger, nice and tight. We don't want to do this too firmly because if we do it firmly, we'll begin to close the holes up. But we're just going to rub that cloth over our holes first. This is going to give us a much flatter surface on which our stitching will sit. And we can see 
we've got lovely smooth surface there and we're going to give the best representation to our stitch albeit it appears we've used quite a brutal tool to make those holes let's have a look at how it stitches so we have our holes made we've used a really cool tool to give us a stitch line that is perfectly parallel to our edge and we can see there you can see my hand through the holes that's how big the holes are in saddlery you cannot get away with that because the thread will ride and slip leather work is not saddlery if that were on a bag that is not detrimental to the bag it's not going to be put under stress or duress like working leather so it will be absolutely fine we will get away with it okay there are saddlers bridle makers harness makers out there that will cringe at this but it's different it's not the same and this is one of the biggest problems with the advice that people are dishing out on the internet is context they're looking at it from a saddle perspective or how they think a saddler should do it because a saddler has a fair understanding that there are different ways of achieving the goal it's people that are kind of in the myth the want the wannabes uh, harsh but i'm going to stick with that those that want to be clever or want to sound clever or want to appear clever are saying all this rubbish and it's working against you yes you can have a big hole if you're stitching leather goods would i use it on an item no i wouldn't but if somebody's really struggling you can achieve with this and we're going to have a look at the result that it will give you and more importantly why it's also nice and big so it's a good foundation on how we're going to stitch use a clam the reason that you need a clam is because it keeps your leather steady and it governs your tension if you stitch freehand you cannot govern the tension the same way so that's an absolute must i'm going to be stitching right-handed right-hand priority so are you the reason that i'm teaching you to stitch right-handed right-hand priority is because i can talk about this cast it becomes evident and it becomes clear we will talk about left-handed so i'm not breaking it up into doing it left-handed and do it right-handed we're going to talk about both at the same time because you will both as left-handers and right-handers have to stitch left-handed and right-handed at some point people say usually right-handed i can't stitch left-handed left-handed people say yeah that's not a problem because they've been doing everything both their whole lives but the truth is you have a needle in each hand you are stitching left and right handed at the same time anyway so right hand needle first available empty hole one thread one needle at each end of the thread and we find our center technically now we have two threads one on the front one on the back right handed right hand priority that means that the leather the grain side is facing the right the flesh side is on the back the first needle to go in the hole is the right hand needle now as we look at this certainly as we look at the back we've got two objects sticking out the back this is critical to this style of stitching our left hand needle goes between those two objects not on top can't find it not on top not at the front not on the outside it goes in the middle this is the first step in prioritizing your thread we then create a cross with our two needles which creates a loop if we keep that cross we can't swap our threads over we then pull through eight to ten inches or so index finger comes over the top we pull to orders i'm going to be doing this with different irons different angles and i'll zoom out to give you a better overview left hand needle goes now into the back of the hole still between the two objects now the two objects are the threads this needle is between the two we pull to make sure we haven't pierced and we cast i'm going to talk about the casting in a moment but we're going to take out all of our slack now as you look at this from the top 
we can see both sides of that stitch. Tension is a huge factor. If we pull this stitch too tight, we can actually tear the leather between the two holes. This is called a dead man. It's called a dead man with good reason. There is no resurrecting it whatsoever. Now we can stitch a heavy leather, we can put a lot of tension on it, and we can get used to it. We perhaps may have a thinner leather on the back, and we put that same power, and all of a sudden we've damaged the leather on the back. So we tension as a visual thing. Because I need to apply 22 and 3 quarter pounds of pressure to each thread to seat this stitch properly. That's for 3 mil case leather, 0.6 mil tiger. If I stitch two pieces of 3 mil together, I need to apply 18 and a half pounds of pressure to each thread. Well, that's ridiculous. How do I teach you what that is? It's just not possible. So we tension visually. So we grab our threads so they won't ride through our finger. And we quite simply pull. And we pull until they disappear from view. And the minute they disappear from view, we stop pulling, we hold it, and then we relax. That's the correct tension for this thread and this leather. That will work every time irrelevant of what leather or thread you're using. That will stop any heartache with tearing the hole in the middle. Now you can already see that that stitch is beginning to pop itself back out again. That's fine. If you do have a soft leather on the back and a firmer leather on the front, defer to the soft leather. Once that's seated, that's your tension. Don't try and seat them both, they won't. This will sit slightly proud, this will sit slightly flat. That's fine, but defer to the soft side always. So that's our first stitch placed. It's not finished, but it's placed. The next, right hand needle, next available empty hole. We pop that in the hole. We have two objects on the back, our needle and our thread. Don't discount this, there's a reason for it and the reason's coming up. Our left hand needle goes in the gap, it's our jam in our sandwich. We create our cross with our two needles, we pull through, eight, ten inches or so. Grip with the three fingers of the right hand, index finger over the top, pulls the thread towards us. This does two things. One, it puts that thread under tension in the hole. So a thread under tension is a lot harder to pierce than a relaxed thread. So that's going to help us prevent piercing our thread. Um, it also clears the thread from the side of the hole into which we want to put our second needle. Again, it's coming out between the two threads, the jam in our sandwich. Now, because we put it under tension, we hoped we haven't pierced it. The needles that we're using, after all, are actually blunt harness needles or saddler's needles, depends in, who hand in whose hand they are. But we never assume we haven't pierced, so we pull that thread on and then we cast. And we'll talk about this in more detail in a moment. We're going to take out all the slack. Absolutely no power at full extension. No tension, and we can see the difference in the two stitches. If our stitching or our tension is inconsistent, that will appear. So again, we're going back to our tension. Over the top, we can see this stitch appear. We come back in, grab our thread so it doesn't slip through our fingers. We pull until it disappears from view. We hold it and then we relax. What's happening here? When we apply all of that force to this stitch, half of it bounces back and we can see it again. But what we don't know is half the force that we're applying to this stitch, we actually also apply to this stitch. But then only a bit of that bounces back, so that sits in better. When we do our next stitch, this 
pulls in fully, relaxes back 50%. This pulls in, but only relaxes back 25%. This pulls in, but doesn't relax back. So we finally seat our stitch third on. So when we get to our third stitch, we finish our first. And that continues all the way down. So exactly the same again. Right hand needle next available empty hole. Let go. Left hand needle jamming our sandwich goes between the two objects, create that cross. Pull through, pull the thread out the way, putting it under tension so we don't pierce it. Put the left hand needle back into the empty side of the hole. Pull that thread to make sure we haven't pierced and cast. Take it out, come back, get nice and intimate. I'm going to stay with this side now because if you're watching carefully, you will see all three stitches move. And as I relax, this first one will bounce back. This will bounce back a smoosh. This is seated. Now this one looks slightly smaller because there's only one thread in this hole here. We haven't done any back stitches, but in each hole here, we have two threads. So this one looks a little smaller. We're only focusing on these two at the moment. So if I do one more of those, a little bit quicker, we'll see as we tension, we'll come back in nice and intimate. We pull and we see that one comes in quite deeply. We relax it, it comes back. And now we see these three are looking far more consistent. So why do we cast? Now this is not the ideal iron to talk about casting, but I'm gonna cover it here as um, a prelude to what's coming up. Casting assists you in getting your face stitch sitting correctly. And casting is fine if you are doing it in the right place for the right reason. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna continue the next stitch and I'm ready now to cast. My expectation is this loop here, get it on camera, this loop here is going to form my next stitch. I want that stitch to go from the bottom of the previous hole to the top of the next hole. Now, if I don't cast, or if I do something weird like casting on the back, that's going to mess up that stitch. So now if I don't cast, and again, this is not necessarily the best iron to do this. What has happened here is this little loop now, which was our big loop, our expectation was it was coming from the bottom of the previous hole and going in to the next hole. Now, because I haven't cast, it's gone from the bottom of the previous hole to the bottom of the next hole. So as I tension, that immediately now is going to look flatter. So if I do another stitch, exactly the same without casting, we'll see a little bit more evidence of how that looks. And we have a much flatter stitch. Again, not the best irons. But because this is our prime side, we want our prime side to look the best that it can. Ultimately, we are stitching a single layer of leather. That is working against us. We have a good grain side that our stitching is sitting on on the front, but we have a rough flesh side on the back and our holes are made from the front. So the holes are smooth here. The holes exit on the back. So the holes are rough. Everything's working against the stitch on the back. So at this moment in time, we are not worried about the back. We'll get onto that shortly. So now we're going to recover. We're going to do another stitch. And I'm not going to spend much more time on this iron because I want to teach you how it looks with a, a decent iron. Again, jamming our sandwich goes between the two objects. We pull through. And now we've decided, well, we should cast because we want it to go from the bottom to the top. The best way of doing that is lifting this loop above. So when we do that, it will go from the bottom of the previous hole to the top of the next hole. 
but we can't hold that loop because if we do and we let go gravity will drop it down so the easiest way is to cast because in casting that actually puts the loop high and that's what causes our stitch to jump at the angle that we want we come back in we tension let me do five or six more stitches so there with quite a brutal iron we can actually achieve a reasonable stitch now we don't have the lovely sort of domino affair going on because the holes aren't quite right for what we want but the truth is if this is what you have you can achieve that's a credible stitch yes it can look better but nonetheless it is still a credible stitch but we can see here where we failed to cast and these two look completely different to these and these that's about consistency we look at our back and our back whilst consistent looks flat but we can see here these two stitches there's a little bit of an angle to them I'll talk about that in more detail I don't want to spend any more time on these irons but what I do want to highlight is you can achieve with them using this style of stitching.